So today, as we continue with the theme of a month of Thanksgiving, today will be tailored around a belly full of Thanksgiving. And why did I entitle it the sermon that? Because today we're going to speak about Jonah. And so let us, let us pray, and then we'll get into God's word of Jonah chapter 2, and we'll look at the whole chapter. Let us pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we love you and we thank you. You've already done so many marvelous things. You only do marvelous things, your word says. So we thank you for that. Thank you for the first snowfall as we're here together as a church family in the house of God. Thank you for uh, the, the sweet taste and aroma still of the Veterans Day service and the worship that just took place. The fellowship, um, just speaking to one another, each person made in your image, how precious that is. Lord, please speak to your people today by way of the Holy Spirit, through your Holy Scriptures. Help me to do justice to them, Father, to rightly divide the Word and to present it in a way that's pleasing unto you. And I ask this in Jesus' name, and all of Spencer Port Bible said, Amen. So Jonah chapter 2, you're familiar with this, because even my six-year-old daughter in the back of Angelina would prob- is familiar with the account, I don't call them stories, I'll call them accounts because stories could be fiction or nonfiction, but the account of Jonah, which is one of the minor prophetic books, minor prophets, but not because they're less important, but because they're smaller in size. There's 12 of them. And this one is so well known because of the whale or the fish cartoons of the big fish coming along and water spouting out of the top of his head and all those type of things and Jonah getting swallowed up. And that's all nice and cute. But the reality is this is a pivotal, pivotal book. It's crucial. Very, very pivotal. And so really as I sent in the text, chapter 2, which we'll look at all of it, in fairness, I have to read the last verse of chapter 1. And so I'll do that. Just to give you a little background, this was a situation in which Jonah did did not want to be in. Jonah, a Jewish prophet, did not want to answer his call. He did not want to respond to what God was calling him to do. And maybe you can relate to that. His assignment was to go to the Ninevites. And where was Nineveh? Well, it just so happened to be the capital city of Assyria. And what came out of the Assyrians when they intermingled with the Jewish people, as we found out in John chapter 4? Samaritans. So why would Jonah want to deliver a message of hope to them. He didn't. So what did he do? He went on a ship in Joppa to flee to Tarshish, totally opposite direction as far as you can go. And then the Lord sent a great tempest, a great storm. The boat is breaking. Mariners are praying to their gods. They wake Jonah up. Jonah's sleeping. They wake him up. They say, call on your God. They cast lots to see who's responsible for this. That was an Old Testament method of determining God's will. And guess who the lots fell on? Jonah. Because you can't run from God's will. David said, if I go to the depths of hell, you're there. You cannot run from the presence or the call of God. You can try. As it's been said, you can run, but you can't hide. And that's exactly where Jonah was in this account. Jonah, still in chapter 1, says it's my fault. He admits to it. And although the mariners were kind to begin with, they agreed to his request of tossing him overboard. And there's where we'll pick up in the last verse of chapter 1, it says, Now the Lord had prepared. Manah is the Hebrew word, and I had to look that up because 
I kept on thinking about that word prepared. The Lord had prepared a great fish. Most believe this was a whale to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the whale, belly of the fish, three days and three nights. Let me pause and say to you, as you probably know, why this is so pivotal. It's pivotal because Jesus Christ himself refers to this exact passage in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12, verse 39 through 41. I'll read 38. It says, Then certain of the scribes and Pharisees, this is Matthew chapter 12, certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. There shall be no sign given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. If you do not believe in the account of Jonah, you are saying that Jesus Christ is a liar. That's ultimately what you're saying. If this is just a children's story about a big fish or a whale and a guy that was running away didn't want to preach to his enemies, if this is just a story, then Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, is a liar. This is pivotal. As Jesus refers to his own death, burial, and resurrection, pointing back to when Jonah was literally in the belly of the whale of this great fish for three days and for three nights. So chapter 2 is completely a prayer. Now the scene has been set and Jonah is literally in this whale's belly. Henceforth, once again, the name of the sermon, a belly full of thanksgiving. Chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly. Why did he pray? It says, Then Jonah prayed because he was in a place of despair, place of desperation. He was at his wit's end. Now some believe that Jonah actually died. I don't necessarily believe that, but I don't want to argue with you about it. Whether he died or he didn't die, and he was, remained alive in this whale's belly, he was in a very, very, very difficult place. And spiritually speaking, you and I in all likelihood are not going to end up in the belly of a whale, but we have been in very, very difficult spots. Spots in which we then decide to pray. Spots of despair, spots, places of anguish, brokenness. And as I was reading this one last time this morning, as it happened so often, and I looked at the clock this time, because I wanted to remember, Lord, what time did you show me this? At 8.20 a.m. in my High Falls office, I realized something about this prayer. This is a prayer of salvation. This prayer, verse 1 through 10, could be used today as we look at how a person comes to know Christ, how a person is born from above, born again. Verses 1 through 10 are the prayer. Verses 2 through 6 are the descriptors of the situation that Jonah is in. 7, 8, and 9 are reflection Repentance and confession. And verse 10 is deliverance. You see? Now, I know some of you may not believe in the sinner's prayer. Now, let me tell you this. I believe in the sinner's prayer, and I don't believe in the sinner's prayer. Let me explain before you get mad at me. First of all, you're looking at a converted soul by the sinner's prayer. So don't tell me that the sinner's prayer is not real, because I'm going to say you're wrong. I know how I got saved. 
okay? It was 12 years old in the back of Resurrection Bible Church when I said a sinner's prayer led by Jim Guttaker, and I know that day, that moment, Jesus Christ entered into my life as Lord and Savior, as I wept like a little baby. However, don't tell me that this is how someone gets saved. Say this prayer with me, brother. Dear God, dear God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No. No. Just like last week, God heals different ways, God saves different ways. But what I want you, I pray that you get, is when we look at these ten verses, this is how God saves, in a sense. Prayer. You believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. Prayer. Number one, you speak to God. You cry out to God like Jonah is. And most of the time when this happens, when somebody's truly converted, they didn't just say a prayer. When they're truly converted, it comes through brokenness, despair, desperation, getting to a point where they know there's no other hope. And they reach out as God reaches down and they grasp on to the hem of the garment of Christ, just like that woman, woman with the issue of blood for 12 years. He says in verse 2, here's the prayer, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. I cried, I lift up to my voice. Why? Because of my affliction. And he heard me. God hears you. As last week with the ten lepers, God sees you as well. He hears you. He sees you. Even if you're in the belly of a proverbial whale, he sees you. He hears you. As I mentioned last week, and I stand by this statement, my closest times to the Lord is when I'm in the most desperate places. It's just how God designed it. He knows what to prepare for you. To get you into a place of desperation, Jonah literally needed a whale. And by the way, this demonstrates to us God's control of the animal kingdom. Now today what we've done, Genesis says we have dominion over the fish in the sea and the birds of the air. But today, like in many other cultures, the Hindu culture, for example, if you go to India, you driving down the street and you've got to choose between a cow and a person, which one to hit, there goes the person. God never designed us to love animals more than people. You understand that. Now, I'm going to tell you something right now. And my kids know this. We have a cat that we got recently. I never thought I'd have a cat because my wife's allergic. I had kittens growing up, cats growing up. That's, I like cats. I'm not a dog person, okay? Not to offend you. I really enjoy my cat, okay? Uh, really. I, I love the cat. I got him a little name tag. It says Brewer. It has a cross. He's a Christian cat underneath. You know I'm joking about that. But I did put the cross on it. I mean, I love the cat. He, he's affectionate to me. I feed him. I call his name. He runs to me better than my children do a lot of times. But listen, he's a cat. He's an animal. He doesn't have a soul. If it came down to it, I am certainly not going to pick Brewer, my cat, over one of my children. Most of the time. No, just kidding. You know that. Never would I. Never would I. Now, he brings me joy. He gives me affection. But he's an animal. And God says, I have dominion over him. As God has dominion over the animals. Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel was just fine. He closed the mouths of the lion. The donkey speaking to Balaam. God has control. The colt waiting for Jesus. Prepared. The sacrifice of animals in the Old Testament for various offerings demonstrates that yes, animals, the proverb says, you're wise if you're kind to your beast or your animal, but they're not to be more important than you. And we're even struggling with that today. We are concerned about whales being killed, but we're not concerned about babies being murdered in the womb. Is that a problem? In God's economy, it's a big one. 
Hands that shed innocent blood he hates. And so, as Jonah is crying out to God in his affliction, God hears him. He says, out of the belly of hell, and that's why some believe maybe he literally died. I don't believe so. I believe if you're in a whale's belly, you feel like you're in hell. We went to Salem Mass recently on the crusade, and you'll meet him someday, because once you meet him, you'll never forget him. My good friend and co-labor in Christ, Randy, about six foot seven, you can't miss him. And we were in Salem, and we all started laughing because when we left Salem Mass, which was very hostile toward the gospel, especially if you're preaching in the open air, we were driving away, and he was voice recording a message, and he said, just leaving Salem, it was hell. And we all started laughing. It wasn't really hell. This is not really hell, but certainly it feels like it for Jonah. This is it. I'm all done. I'm about to meet my maker. And certainly you felt like that. Many of you, or you know someone who has. But see, Jonah knows why he's there, because he's running from God. He knows why the fish was prepared, because he's running from God. The worst thing you can do in this life, one of the, outside of receiving the gift of salvation, is once you received that gift of salvation, to run from the call God has on your life. He'll find you. He will find you. People like to call the Holy Spirit the hound from heaven. I, I don't really like that just because I don't like him thinking of him as like a hound, you know, a dog running like this. But I get the point. God knows. God sees. You see, today it's very simple. You think at least. Well, that's it. They're changing the rules. We're all, that's it. We're, we're doing, we just had our midterms, and I'm, where are you going to run to? Tarshish, otherwise known as Tennessee, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina. I mean, come on, it's the truth. We don't want to run into the fire. We try to run away from it. And what happens when you run away from the fire? People die. People perish. And these Ninevites needed to be rescued, but they needed to hear the message to rescue them. And this reluctant running prophet was sleeping on a boat going in the opposite direction. So God prepared a great fish for him. What has he prepared for you? God knows what you need to get you following that call, to be in his will. Now, I believe in God's permissive and his perfect will. I'm not going to get into that today. We can talk about that one-on-one -on -one if you want. Maybe I'll learn from you. You can learn from me, maybe. I don't know. But God's will is real. And when he calls you, he means it. And to run from it will do you no good. And you'll end up in a similar position as Jonah. Verse 3 says, For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about, all thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Can you imagine? I can't. I can't even imagine being on a boat in a bad storm. That kind of scares me, just that idea. But let alone in the belly of a whale. Complete darkness, water cascading over you. Then I said, verse 4, I am cast out of thy sight. Yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. Continuing with the descriptors, and now God is moving inside the belly of the whale with this reluctant Jewish prophet, Jonah. It says in verse 5, The waters compassed me about, even to the soul, the death, the depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. What a picture! What an absolute picture we have here. You see, Jesus is not just an insurance policy. State Farm Jesus, Geico Jesus, Allstate Jesus. You only call on him when you get a flat tire or when you're in need. That's when you call upon Allstate Jesus. It doesn't work like that. 
But you see, this is the situation now that Jonah is in to a certain extent. He wants the insurance policy. And maybe you or I have been in that situation. And what has God done? God has put us in the whale of a belly. The belly of a whale. Whale of a belly would be probably impossible. But you get the point. God's working in Jonah. It's been said, and I'm sure our veterans can relate to this or have heard the saying, there's no such thing as an atheist in a foxhole. And right now, Jonah's in the foxhole. You are about to pass crossover. And at that point, at that point, God will never become more real this side of eternity than that moment before you pass over. It's getting very, very real to Jonah. Verse 6, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. A prayer to begin with, describing your situation. Lord, I can't take it anymore. I feel like I'm just going to give up. I can't do this anymore. You don't understand, Lord. My mother has done this. My spouse has done this. It's the same thing. This is a picture of someone truly who's going to be delivered. And they finally got to their point of fainting and despair where they cried out to God from the belly of a whale. And he hears you and he sees you and he will deliver you. Verse 7, when my soul fainted within me. What it takes. You just give up. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. He is near to those with a broken and a contrite heart. He doesn't despise that. If you're going to glory, glory in this, that you know me. He opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Do you understand this? This is it. This is it. Jonah's soul is fainting. He's remembering the Lord. Second part of verse 7, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thy holy temple. Now this is very interesting, verse 8. It's almost like when Jesus asked the woman at the well, go and call your husband. And you have to prayerfully meditate and look at this and look at the passage and say, why, why is this here? But this, you know why this is here? Because now the reflection... The regret, the meditation on Jonah's life personally. And listen to what he says. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Now that's wordy. Here's what it means. Those who are wasting their time on idols are abandoning their own mercy. Why would he say that? Because he's in the belly of a whale realizing, man, I wasted so much time on worthless stuff. I wasted so much time. How many family trips can I take? How many rounds of golf can I play? How many vacations can I go on? How much can I invest in the wrong things that have no eternal value? And Jonas has time now all alone, just him and God, feeling like he's in hell, confessing, saying, I've wasted so much time. So many idols, so many things I did that have no value whatsoever. Verse 9. But he's going to make a sacrifice. It says, but I will sacrifice unto thee with what? The voice of thanksgiving. See, God loves that. God loves the voice of thanksgiving. And I'll say it again. I know I've said it at least once or twice. To me, the spirit of thanksgiving is the spirit of Christ. Really, the way we celebrate thanksgiving is, is what well, do you know what I think about? I think about a manger. I think about a baby born, wrapped in swaddling cloth. 
I think about three wise men. Not Tom, Barry, and Jim this time. But the three wise men in the account, which we'll hear about shortly, in the birth of our Savior. How simple, how sincere, how wonderful. The Bible says a wonderful thing, a marvelous work. It's what it is. In a voice of thanksgiving, God hears. We have so much to be thankful for every day in this land of the free, home of the brave. Still is. Yeah, it's different. Yeah, it's not like it used to be. Yeah, there's turmoil. There's craziness and nonsense, all of it. It's all around us. But we still have this beautiful sanctuary. We still have so much around us in the form of friends and family and food and freedom. A voice of thanksgiving. Jonah says, I will pay that that I have vowed. What did he vow? I don't know. Maybe he said he would go, and he didn't. I don't know what he vowed. Be careful when you make a vow to God. Be careful about that. Better you don't do it, the Bible says. Be very careful. But he's reflecting. He's repenting. He's confessing. You see? That's what's required for God to convert a soul. Repentance is a lost part of the gospel message. Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel. That's how he started his earthly ministry. Jesus, do you think these men died when the tower fell on them in Siloam because they were worse sinners? No, nay. But unless you likewise repent, you too will perish. I'll tell you what you need to know, not what you want to know. And here's what everybody needs to know. You need to repent. You need to have a change of mind about who you are, who God is, if you know not Jesus Christ. And repentance is initial, but it's also ongoing. We need to repent daily once we come to know Christ. Why? Because all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And this is a fact, this side of eternity. Salvation, the last part of verse 9, salvation is of who? The Lord. It's of the Lord. There's such freedom in knowing that. There's such freedom in any gospel ministry, whether you're teaching the word of God, preaching the gospel, whether you're inside the walls or outside, there's such a tremendous freedom to realize salvation is of the Lord. It's, it's not humanly possible. And you know, you watch sometimes and you can see when people are trying to save someone. You got to do this. You got to do this. No, no, listen. No, let me keep telling you this. And it's like salvation is of the Lord. He's mighty to save. We plant the word of God. Plant the seed. We water it. And God, in his sovereign will, gives the increase. It's the only one. Some plant, some water, 1 Corinthians. God gives the increase. But oh, what a joy it is to plant and to water and to watch God save. And I must tell you this in sadness. According to Jesus, many are called Few are chosen. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. Few there be that find it. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many go that way. In the parable of the sower, in one account, Mark chapter 4, the seed, the word of God, that falls on good ground, a good heart, and bears fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. There's only one out of those four. I'm not saying 25% of the people that hear the gospel get saved. No, what I'm saying is this. It's the minority, not the majority. I know that's a hard word, but that's the words of Jesus. I'm not God. I'm not the potter. I'm the clay. And to understand and rest in that, the sovereignty of God, 
Yet God gives us an ability to share the gospel, to have a free will, is amazing. And we can't figure it out. And we're not supposed to figure it out. We're supposed to rest in it. And we're supposed to fulfill the great commission, not the omission. And so now, more than ever, it's easier to say, you know what? I'm going to get on a boat. Just get away. I just, I'm just going to want to get away from everything. I'm just going to get away. Meanwhile, there's 120,000 people in New York State that don't know their right hand from their left, and they're going to perish. But everybody wants to go down south. Come on. Yeah, you got the evangelist today, folks. Sorry. Come on. Really? That's the great omission, not the great commission. Who's going to tell them? See, Jonah didn't want to go. Listen, can I tell you this? I've been to Florida now, and I've been to Tennessee, and guess what? I like both of those states a lot in my flesh. I like the sun. I hate the cold. Ask my wife. She tells me I'm a baby because I get cold all the time. Okay? I like the sun. I like the beach. I like everything about Florida. I like everything about Tennessee, but that's not where I need to go. And I know people who have gotten on that proverbial ship, and guess what? They are miserable down south because they weren't supposed to go. They weren't supposed to go. Why? Because if you are true, born again, child of the living God, he calls you to run into the fire, not away from it. You want to go on vacation to those places? Go ahead. I plan on it. And you know, the Lord reminded me, be careful, because I may call you to go down south, and then you'll look like a hypocrite. You go if God calls you to go. That's when you go. There's nothing like being in the will of God. There was an evangelist who said this. He said, his name was Arthur Blessed. He said, I'd rather die in the will of God than live outside of it. I would rather die in the will of God than live outside of it. It's quite a statement, isn't it? Here comes deliverance. We had prayer, heartfelt, despair, reflection, repentance, and now deliverance. And the Lord, verse 10, sp spoke or spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Confess, repent, and I will spare you your life. And what does Jonah do? Just to give you some background. He does it. He goes. He preaches. You know what the people do? You're not going to believe this. They repent. They call a fast. They repent. And then how does Jonah feel? He's mad. He says, God, I knew you were, you were loving, full of kindness, slow to anger. I'm mad. I'm going down to Destin, Florida. I'm going to put a beach umbrella up, otherwise known as a gourd, so I can have shade. And God comes to him and says, Jonah, Jonah. You know what's amazing about you, Jonah? Then says the Lord in verse 10 of chapter 4, Thou hast had pity on the gourd for which you have not labored or worked for, neither made it grow, which came up in a night, and it perished in a night. Should not I spare Nineveh, the great city? This is God speaking. Where are more than 120,000 persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. It's amazing to me that God would give Jonah another chance. Absolutely amazing. But it's amazing that I get another chance every day. I'm actually amazed at it, to be honest with you. I really am. See, that's what grace is. Grace keeps giving undeservedly to the recipient. Undeservedly. Jesus Christ, our Messiah, our Lord, full of grace and full of truth. Well, I want to end this message similar to the way I ended last week. And this week, I want to read just 10 more reasons to be thankful. 10 more reasons. These are pretty much completely vertical. 
Last week was more horizontal, food and shelter, things of that nature. Number one, salvation. Salvation, it's free, it's a gift of God, lest any man should boast. Salvation, a reason to be thankful. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A picture of Jonah, the belly of the whale. A picture of Christ in the tomb. The burial, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Number two, second chances. I'm thankful for second chances. I'm thankful for thousands of second chances. Number three, repentance. Thankful for repentance. Number four, having a voice of thanksgiving to offer unto God, like Jonah did. Number five, the opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Number six, I'm thankful for the mercy of God, not getting what I deserve. Number seven, I'm thankful for the grace of God, giving me what I don't deserve. Number eight, the kindness of God. God is so kind, slow to anger. Kindness of God. Number nine, I mentioned it, that God is slow to anger. Can you imagine if you and I were always like that, slow to anger? Honestly, I have one friend like that. Actually, he's Pastor Greg Thompson. You've met him. He's, it's hard to get him mad. Really, really hard. He has that fruit in him that God has grown. But most everyone uh, else, you know, get ang- angry kind of quickly. Heard the term short fuse before? Heard that before. People referring to me at times. And then number 10, God himself. God himself, not his hand, not what he can give me, not the genie Jesus, not I'll worship you, God, if you give me this. I'll worship you, if I'll worship you when you give me this. No, not genie Jesus. But God himself, not his hand, but his face, his presence the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Three in one. Who said this? Who said this? Let us make man, that includes woman, let us make man in our image. The greatest creation that God has ever made was in the belly of a whale. And it's also in the seats of Spencerport Bible this morning. You are the greatest creation God has ever made, as messed up as you are. And that's how God is glorified. In that a person, a people, that could be radically flawed, radically messed up, tons of problems, fallen, God still loves you, cares for you, is merciful unto you, gracious unto you, still slow to anger, giving you chance after chance after chance. A belly full of thanksgiving. See, it's good to have a full belly. That's always nice. Right? But a belly full of thanksgiving. To just be filled with thanksgiving unto God, it'll do something to you, I promise you that. Start looking at the other side, because it's very easy to just let a gourd grow over us. And have a pity party. And as you know, no one likes to attend pity parties. So let's have a party of thanks. Of thanksgiving. Not just, just like Veterans Day. Let's not just celebrate veterans on Veterans Day. Let's not just say thank you on Veterans Day. Let's not just be thankful on Thanksgiving. But every day is a day of giving thanks. Amen? Let's, let's pray. Now who's coming up? Alma or Tom? Who's going to be this time? Alma pointed to you, Tom, so now I know. Last time they tricked me. Okay, let me, let me just say a prayer, and uh, thank you so much for everything. Father, we thank you for your word, and um, Lord, so many valuable, valuable insights in your word and this account of the prophet Jonah. What a prayer. What a place he was in. I think we can relate to a certain degree. We've all been there uh, to some extent place of desperation where our soul is fainting. And Lord, that's when you work most. When you hear the broken and the contrite. You welcome that. And you heal. And you help. And you save. Pray if there's anybody in here this morning that you have done the work. The saving work. 
to harvest their soul, to bring them into the kingdom of God, that they would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they've crossed over today, and they will inherit the kingdom of God by your grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. It's in that name that we pray. Amen.